I could oh. take my laptop in for a hard drive transplant this week. No way. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, listen, let's get started. Yeah, we, there are 12 lessons uh, total, and we'll, we'll figure it out, uh, okay. 11 and 12. Um, I don't think 11 and 12 are as important as these two, because these really kind of serve as the highlight. What, what we've been leading to in the uh, discipleship class has all been how you know, certainly God touches, transforms our lives, how we deal with sin and our relationships with each other and how we grow in our relationship with God and each other. And today ultimately is where the rubber hits the road, lessons nine and 10, that there is a purpose for all of this. This relationship with God that we have on this earth has the purpose of serving other people. And that's ultimately lesson 10, what the church is. So we're going to start with lesson nine. Lesson nine, first of all, you are called by God to serve each other. People ask, what is my purpose here? Your purpose on earth is to be a blessing to other people as you have been blessed by God, to use what God has given you. And so let's start with Matthew 28, which is really the foundation of what the church is and who we are and how we fit. So Jesus came to his disciples, this is after his resurrection, by the way, and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you, and remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. So we start with a question uh, Jesus is telling us to go and be of service to those around us, to our neighbors. And so oftentimes Jesus uses this phrase neighbors. It indicates the type of relationship that we are supposed to have with people, a neighborly relationship. Well, I know where I turn when I want to learn how to be a neighbor to somebody. Mr. Rogers, right? <laughs> what, <laughs> what would Jesus do and what would he say? Turn on Mr. Rogers. Learn how to be a good neighbor, right? Who is my neighbor? All right? And this is what we have to struggle with today. Cain asked God, am I my brother's keeper? Do you remember that lesson, Cain and Abel? Do you remember the lesson of Cain and Abel? And these, this brotherly uh, uh, fight that was going on. You are talking about your daughters fighting. You know, he's talking, Cain and Abel were fighting. And... Uh, uh, Cain, of course, killed Abel, right? And God said, where's your brother Abel? He said, am I my brother's keeper? Guess what the answer to that is? Yeah. Yes. Jonah was upset with God for including Gentiles in God's mercy. Who were the neighbors? These Gentile neighbors of Jonah. The Jonah wanted to see wiped out. He was so upset that God wasn't going to kill every Gentile in Nineveh, that he went and he cried. And he said, I don't understand why God's being so mean to me and not wiping these people out. <laughs> How crazy is that? Jesus then goes on in an earlier lesson that we, uh, that we didn't read here. But um, Jesus says that neighbors are not only those people whom we like, nor only those who look like us, Neighbors are not defined by their kinship with us, but by their need. So the people today that are struggling in the South because of the weather, the storms, who are they? I don't know any of their names, but they're our neighbors. We have to find a way to care for them. Touching on things political today, the Haitian immigrants, migrants that are in Springfield, Ohio, and out here in Charleroi, PA, who are they? They are our neighbors. They're in need. We are here to bless them. And I'm not talking politics. How should we deal with immigration, blah, blah, blah. That has nothing to do with it. The point is they're here. How we treat them is a reflection of our relationship with Jesus Christ. If we treat them with cruelty and unkindness, we are not representing Jesus, right? They are our neighbors, okay? They are in need. So the question then becomes, how do I become a neighbor to somebody I don't even know, okay? Well, we identify with the people who are suffering, right? 
And uh, in our, in our, I'm not going to read this. There's a, a lesson from Luke chapter 10, verses 30 to 37. That is the story of the Good Samaritan. Do you remember the story of the Good Samaritan? Let me tell it to you. Jesus wanted to tell people about the answer to the question of who a neighbor is, and he told a story about a Samaritan um, who um, there was a, a uh, there was a non-Jewish man who had been beaten, uh, or a Jewish man, pardon me, who was beaten and bloody, and um, left to die on the side of the road by, by thieves. And we were told that priests, a priest came by and saw him bloodied and beaten. And the priest did not stop to help him. Because the priest did not want to get his hands dirty. If you touch a dead body as a priest, you are therefore unclean and not permitted to participate in worship. He said, like, I can't do that. Another Jewish fellow passed by him and said, I'm not going to go near that body. There might be a trap set by these thieves, and they might beat me up too. But all of a sudden, a Samaritan comes along. Guess what? He's not even a Jew. And he grabs this man. He takes him to a place into a village and pays for his recuperation. And Jesus asked the question, who is the neighbor? The man who acted in a neighborly fashion. The Gentile, right? That's really important to that lesson. So this man, these two were enemies in terms of their countries of origin. But he was a neighbor. That's why I go back to the this Haitians in Springfield. I don't care what you think about them, whether they should or should not be here. They're here. And they are our neighbors. And we should be taking care of them. I think folks haven't gotten the gospel lesson here. We cannot be indifferent, Jesus says. We need to express compassion, not sympathy. Do you know the difference between sympathy and compassion? Sympathy is like, oh, uh, my prayers and thoughts are with you. Hi, <laughs> Peggy. So what? Who cares about your prayers and thoughts with somebody, right? Empathy is, I'm going to somehow help you. I feel for you. I feel the pain that you feel. I'm going to give myself for you. And you need to therefore be willing to sacrifice. The Good Samaritan did what? Help. Gave. Gave financially. Risked by helping this man. He gave of his time, his money, his love. And... Uh, you know, so oftentimes we say, well, you know, we want to define what our liability is. Well, how much should I give? As much as your neighbor needs, okay? You know, when, when's the end to this? Well, we need to help them. Um, so Jesus is calling us to help by word and deed. By helping people with our, our verbal support, that means that you don't tear them down. If part of your vocabulary is, you're a vermin, you're no good, I hate you, sorry, but that is not of Jesus Christ, okay? And we should not be participating in that type of language about other people. We need to support people. These are people of God, creations of God, beautiful in their sight. But you notice how we demonize people, tear them down so that we no longer have an obligation to care for them. That is not in Jesus' vocabulary. Jesus, only people that Jesus ever tears down are religious leaders. Never, ever, ever common people. So we need to stop tearing people down. We need to build them up with our words, and we also need to build them up with our deeds. Okay, we're going to go over another page or two to let her be. We need to overcome our own, objection, our own objections and barriers that prevent us from helping people. Uh, things like a fear of rejection. Uh, sometimes we're lazy and unwilling to help people who are in need. We can be judgmental. Once again, going back to the Haitian immigrants in Charleroi and Springfield, Ohio, what a, what a perfect illustration of this. We're judgmental, so we don't help. We need to help. Okay? We're ju I, I actually had a true story. As you know, we have food sitting back here. Those on camera can see this. 
This is probably the one I... This is all food back here, believe it or not, that's behind these, that people in the church bring to uh, the church and we give away to people in the community. I actually had a woman, lives, she lives in a nice suburban community, and uh, she said, oh, I won't give to that. Why not? Because those people have plenty of opportunities to get food. They're just trying to take something for free. I said, well, how do you know that? How can you be the judge of that? He said, well, I'm not giving my money for the church to give that food away. Not to those lazy. They're, they're lazy. <laughs> and I just said, I don't know what they are. I said, I've met these people. And I can tell you, it's very possible some are lazy. I've met some that really tick me off on occasion. But I don't know all the circumstances. But I've also met people who are so grateful because they don't have food to put on their table tonight. I'd rather give to somebody, risk giving to somebody who's lazy so that I can also give to people who are desperately in need than not give at all. You know, we have to overcome our judgmentalism towards people and uh, serve our neighbor. This is how do I serve my neighbor by word and deed, by evaluating the time and the financial assets that I have and how do I give. Well, maybe you write a check. And maybe that's all you can give. How do we help the people who are suffering from these storms? Most of us are not going to be able to go down and help them in any tangible way. But we can write a check to help them, right? We have an extra 10 bucks or 15 bucks or 50 bucks that we can go on online. That's why we provide online with our church that ELC or you can go directly there and give directly to food assistance and help to people in need. We have networks already in place so that I think it's like 98 cents on every dollar that you give goes directly help and assistance yeah. to them. Isn't that amazing? It's just great. So I'm really encouraging that. You don't have to give through our ELCA. There are other opportunities to, to give, uh, but please do. If, God, if, you, if you've got food on your table, I think we need to find a way to give to people who are in need. And then uh, also, so we evaluate, how do we use our time our financial resources to be a blessing to them. We need to plant our seeds of, of faith in their hearts by being kind and generous, okay? We pray for them. We pray for the opportunity to bless people. And we plan for time to spend with people so that we can bless them and, and be with them. Um, and understand that this takes place also in the context of the church. And that's where we're gonna skip a lot of this stuff. I'm going really quick through all this stuff. And get to, well, hmm, okay, the church, living life within the church. I only have one page on this. Oh, no. Okay, I see what happened. I see what happened here. Um, you went for a I know, I'm going to need a booklet here. Hold tight. I got one up here. <laughs> Peggy be the best. You gotta get to know Peggy. I know. She's a sweetie. Okay, so we're on to uh, living a life within the church. Okay. So that's also the purpose of the church to understand that sometimes how we care for people takes place in the context of the church. So we have a situation, let's go back to the people who are struggling because of the storm here. Um, there's no way I personally can help those people. But we have a larger structure of the church with our ELCA. Yeah, our congregation can't help them. We don't have enough people to help them. We don't have the resources or the assets to help them. Our assets and resources are limited to be able to help them directly. We can't, we just have no way to go down there. Uh, but the larger church, our ELCA, can help them. We have missionaries and we have people already in place down there. That's why we can so effectively go down there. We work with other churches, other Lutheran churches in that area and other churches, not just Lutheran churches, that are already established that are maybe taking people into their churches because their churches might be a safe place from the storm and the storms and maybe it's the one place that hasn't been hit by the water and the destruction of the storms. So we're putting up cots in some of these churches and providing water for people in these communities. So that's what it means to be church. 
The church is the gathering of all of these assets. It's not just this congregation of Holy Trinity. It's our ELCA. But it's not just our ELCA. It's all of our churches, Baptist churches, and uh, Pentecostal churches, and Roman Catholic churches. We are all doing this work down there in God's name. And thank God for it. Okay? So we need to be a support to that. So we need to understand that the church, let's take a look at the church. I do want to disabuse you of this notion that the church is this building here. It's not. I always have told our folks that if you take a stick of dynamite and put it on each wall of this building and blow it to smithereens, the church is what shows up next week. Because it's not the building. It's not the institution. This is a congregation that is a legal entity and an institution in which we organize the church, but the church, or, and we have our events for the church, but the church is the people. So let's take a look at what the Bible says the church is, so we know how we are called to be a part of this larger institution called the church. Oh, for goodness sakes. Okay, so the church, first of all, is not a human organization, as I mentioned to you. It is something built by the hands of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of the church, and we are foundational bricks and, uh, and building material which God uses to make that building called the church. So it's metaphorical when we talk about the church being a building. The word church itself means the gathering of God's people. Okay? And the work is done, God's work is done in this world through the church, not through the congregation, through the church. And uh, in, the old, in the New Testament, we noticed that, uh, we, we kind of got into this maybe 10 years ago, so I'll mention to you, we have what, what's called the cell. The cell, in our church is kind of like a cell church. We have about uh, uh, 30, 35 to 40 people that are really committed highly to this particular outreach and so forth, that would be kind of a cell church, okay? So we're a small, very intimate uh, congregation. And then, we, and then we organize some churches, some congregations have multiple cells within the congregation, okay? So you'll have really big congregations of a thousand people. And so they have multiple cells within that congregation. And then we have the celebration, the gathering together of the church as a whole, which might be our ELCA, would be a large structure that pulls us all together, a large institution, understanding that the church goes beyond just the borders of East Pittsburgh, that we are larger than that. But we still need to be a part of the local expression of a church somehow. And this is one of the problems that we run into in our country today, is that a lot of people don't believe that they need to be connected to a local congregation. Because I can believe in God all by myself. Well, you can. I can worship God by yourself. No, you can't. <laughs> you can praise God by yourself. You can pray to God by yourself. But worship itself is a team event. Worship is communal in nature. We gather together in God's presence to give thanks for what God has done and to encourage each other so that we might be strengthened and emboldened for our service. And you also need to understand that your gifts that God has given to you don't make any sense outside of the context of the church. We talked about this at our visioning session just the other week, where you have unique gifts that are given to you by God. You do as well, and Peggy does, and I do. We all have unique gifts that God has given us through the gift of the Holy Spirit, but those aren't for your own purpose. They are for the purpose of blessing the world. Well, your gifts by themselves don't make a lot of sense. We need the entire church. So I tell this, um, excuse me, I'm doing so many small groups and small this and that, I, I'm not sure which stories I've told. <laughs> did, I, did I tell the story about us and our church our congregation here starting a after-school program. 
Did you hear that story? Okay, I want to tell that. Because this relates to how the church works and why you are so important. In the late 90s, it was very clear that we needed to do something to reach the kids in this community. Our Woodland Hill School District was, uh, was struggling with the kids, too, and the changes that were taking places, place, and, and kids were, did not have any place to go after school, and we had another problem. Kids were, you know, Woodland Hills was really struggling with educating some of the kids, and a lot of kids were falling behind. And so we said, what can we do about that as a church? And how do we do that? So we decided we were going to start an after-school program that did uh, a reading and math and worked with kids and skill sets and provided a place for them to come because we were noticing in our community too, kids didn't have anywhere to go. They were going home to empty houses and that's where a lot of the problems were, were starting and so forth. And um, so that's what we did. But we, as we gathered together to figure out how to do this, we had clearly two or three different groupings of people. You had one group that said, let's just dig in and let's just do it. And let's just open up the doors and we'll cook the meals and we'll do this. And then we had another group and said, hold on there a second. That's not how you do this. What about the legalities of this? What about the structure of this? How do we guarantee that this continues to exist? How do we fund this for the future? Because this is a very expensive program. Guess what happened? These two were like, loggerheads because they're like you know the one group just wants to get their hands dirty and get it going okay and the one group says we want to we want to start teaching kids how to read and write and do this and other kids we want to work and provide meals for this the, and like I said the structure group they annoyed everybody okay you can't do this and and I will tell you what I finally had to say people don't you understand how important you are to each other. We need people who've got, want to get their hands dirty, get in the kitchen and cook the meals. We need people who like working with the kids. We need people to make sure this structure is legal and it's healthy and it works well and we protect the kids. And that might annoy some of you, but that is really important stuff. And so the people who want to get their hands dirty said, okay. So they tolerated, it was, it was like annoying as heck to them. And I get that, but we finally created the structure. It lasted for, from like 98 until 2014. So it was a good run. The reason why we stopped it is because there was really no longer a need for it. Woodland Hills was, um, was doing a lot of after school type of programs and uh, we just didn't have didn't have the kids, you know, the kids were going there, and that was fine. We served a purpose, and we were able to track those kids and find that those kids, their grade point averages, all of them raised by one to one and a half uh, grade levels from the interaction that we had with them. And it, it, you know, we, so it was, a, it was a worthwhile program. I'm very grateful we did it, but it was a temporary program, but it was really important while we had it. We had anywhere 50 to 80, 100 kids here Every sometimes. Day. We had, we had two different buildings. <laughs> we had this building, and we also were the one that the, the church that's Manna from on high. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, we actually have that building for the older kids and the younger kids up here. It was crazy. It was good. It was very uh, fruitful type of thing. But you see how we couldn't have done that. The people who just wanted to cook meals could not have done this. People who liked teaching the kids couldn't have done it on their own. The people who are really important have the structural skills couldn't have done it on their own. They would have built a program for nothing. It would have gone nowhere. So we need each other. This is what church does. So I'm asking us to be a little kinder to each other because you have unique gifts that fit into the whole that make it possible for us to do some spectacular things. And that's what God has called us. So that's why we exist as a church, a congregation here in East Pittsburgh, because we believe we're called particularly to this community to serve this community. And, uh, and we think we have some unique gifts where we can do that. And as you, for those who are part of the visioning session, that also means that we've, we've uh, COVID kind of killed that mojo that we had, and we've got to re-energize that somehow. But I think we have some incredible gifts and incredible talents and I think God has still called us still to use these gifts. That's what the church is. We are here 
We are the place where your gifts and your abilities uh, are used to be a blessing to their neighbor. Okay, any questions about that? Kind of tie those two lessons together again. I will, here's what, if you can't up here next week, what I'm going to do is I will record that. Okay. And you can either go on YouTube or Facebook, I don't know which one do you do. Yeah. Either of those? Yeah. Either of those? Okay. okay. Either one, we'll just record it and uh, make sure that's available to you. And, uh, and then we'll talk. And maybe I will, it just depends, it depends what time the other ones are being used. Yeah. I got you, I got you. Any, any I questions? I really thought we were done today. That's what I had on my calendar. Oh, right well, you know, and I may have advertised that because I miscounted. I bet you I did. <laughs> because I'm missing somebody with a particular, I'm missing somebody with a particular skill set to help me with, uh, who's, who can do my calendars and figure me out. And I don't think anybody. Nobody, <laughs> nobody can figure me out? Oh my gosh, that's, so we'll my wife has been it. married to me for 40 years, and yeah, I think she'd probably agree with you on that one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, well, listen, let's, let's close with prayer. Thank you, God, for the blessings of this day and for providing for us, for your church. For we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, go in peace, serve the Lord. See you later. Not next week, then, afterwards. Whenever. Oh, okay.